We continue in our tour of Mark's Gospel this morning under the sermon title, The Silent Treatment. So now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. It was calculus. My freshman year at Duke University, I registered in the class that according to my prior coursework, I was fully qualified. Now I'll admit math has never been my strongest suit, but with effort, I was able to hold my own. Yet there I was with the teacher busily putting things on the board, talking as he wrote, and I was utterly and completely lost. Some of the terms and phrases from high school cropped up here and there, but I had no idea what was going on. The TA paused and looked at us students. Any questions, he said? Questions? Why, yes, I had questions, lots of them. But when I turned around, I looked and saw no one else raising their hand. No one was saying anything. I felt panic inside. Did the others understand the concepts? Or were they as clueless as I was? Any questions? I hardly knew where to begin. So you know what? I didn't. I didn't ask a single thing because I was just too darn confused and lost, and I'll admit it, afraid. Afraid to display my ignorance. So I remained silent and walked out of the class. Fear. Fear in the face of the unknown and unfamiliar. Silence in the face of questions. We encounter both reactions in this morning's gospel text. Our study of Mark's gospel continues as we move to the ninth chapter. Do you remember last week, we read from the eighth chapter, where for the first time, Jesus revealed to his disciples what his sure and certain fate would be. Rejection, suffering, and death before ultimate triumph. It was such an unlikely and unexpected narrative to abide that Peter balked at its mere suggestion. Well, today, a chapter later, we see Jesus traveling with his disciples through Galilee. And like a teacher offering students a review session, Jesus discloses once again what he has to look forward to, that he will be betrayed, turned over to be killed, and then rise again. The lesson was hard to hear the first time, and it was hard to hear the second time. Both times, the disciples undoubtedly recognize they've just been told something significant, and both times, they do not understand it. And did you notice how they just respond? Like I offered up to my calculus teacher, they give Jesus the silent treatment. They say nothing, for the text says they are afraid. Their reticence persists and only complicates life further. For as the disciples keep walking to Capernaum with those ignorant blinders on, they do not display their best selves. They start arguing amongst themselves about petty stuff. Who is the greatest? And when Jesus gets around to questioning them about their conversations once they get to their destination, the disciples give Jesus the silent treatment again. Presumably, they're embarrassed, also maybe afraid for Jesus to know the truth. But no matter what, the upshot is they say nothing. Fear. Though it can be a healthy and indeed necessary response to bona fide danger, kicking in that fight or flight instinct, it can also rear its head to our detriment. For making choices based on fear can cloud our thinking, impede our growth. When we do not address or simply avoid what we fear, 
we close ourselves off to new opportunities, illumination. We limit our capacity to engage a topic and therefore understand it better, accept it more fully. We become narrow in our approach and protective of our turf. I read a couple of articles this week about the incidence of fear in the Gospel of Mark. Theology professor Micah Keel notes how Mark often contrasts it with faith. When Jesus stills the stormy waters back in chapter 4, he says to the disciples, Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And again in Mark 5, as Jairus mourns over his seemingly dead daughter, Jesus says to this synagogue leader, do not fear, only believe. Why the connection? Well, because Jesus knows that when hearts are frozen with fear, they become concrete in their understanding and reactionary, unable to see beyond the predicament of the moment. They cease their search for the ways God might be active in a crisis or a confusing situation. They're unable to embrace the possibilities of that phrase we're highlighting these three weeks of our stewardship emphasis. In God we trust. And so they fail to see the restoring hand of God in the midst of confusion. I remember waiting for my turn at the payphone in my freshman dorm on the first Sunday night after classes had begun. I cried as I related my math experience to my parents. I was afraid of failing. Full disclosure, by the end of the month, I had switched to statistics. <laughs> and it went fine. Yet looking back, I wonder if I had stayed the course, spoken up, gotten help. Maybe I could have prevailed. My fear held me back. But you know, it's one thing to remain silent in calculus class when you're an avowed liberal arts major simply fulfilling distribution requirements. It's quite another to remain silent when it comes to our understanding of and relationship with God. Friends, this morning calls us on a couple of levels to boldness. First, it compels us to be bold in our questions in order to drink deeply from the well of faith. Out of fear, the disciples said nothing to Jesus after he disclosed his passion, and as a result, they remained in the darkness about his true nature. But how about you? What is it about the activity of God, the reality of God, the nature of life that you do not understand and indeed perhaps you fear? For I dare say, even amidst the security and reliability of daily routine, those larger questions of life, they baffle and confound us every bit as much as the disciples. Yet engaging such questions, rather than remaining silent, through discussion, through meditation, through study of scripture, why that's how we grow and how we come to behold God more poignantly throughout our life journey. Ask and you shall receive, seek and ye shall find, just as we heard Eddie sing, while he may be found. In other words, we can be bold and ask, who or what is God? What does it mean to live in the shadow of the cross? I mean, how does Jesus save us? And then we wonder, how about our loved ones that don't profess a faith? Those that have no clue who Jesus is. What about them asking questions, particularly in a community of faith that offers a framework and a launch pad for such inquiry? Why, that's where our hearts can be stirred and we draw ourselves more deeply into relationship with God and each other. I think it's a key reason that the Holy Spirit calls us together as church.
For here, here we find a place just like the disciples of old where it's safe to ask questions, safe to rehearse responses, all of which lead us, even if not to answers, into more profound questions, deeper questions that bring us just a hair's breadth closer to the mystery of God. Do not fear, but trust. <coughs> Ask, seek, and ye shall find. But along with the boldness of our questions, I believe the gospel also calls for boldness in our actions. After all, Jesus does allude to a notion when speaking about servanthood that says greatness is found in being last. And further, as Callie said, it is God's work, our hands, Sunday. Yes, today is a day in which our congregation is embodying Jesus' words to be first and experience the kingdom of God. We must be last. Almost 80 of us are participating in this National Service Day, and we get the opportunity firsthand to learn how great it feels to enter into the life of others, even if for a couple of hours, to let them know they are worthy of love, precious enough to sacrifice for, valuable enough to be treasured. Today, any day that we are bold enough to seize the chance to serve, the kingdom of God comes near, and we, we get to usher it in and experience it but only if we say something or do something rather than shrink back in fear and protect our own turf. So today, once more we hear, in God we are to trust. It is a promise born in two of the great phrases that we hear throughout Scripture. First of all, be not afraid. Do not let your fear keep you from approaching the Lord with your questions. Do not let your fear of the unknown cause you to miss an opportunity to grow in understanding or tolerance or deeper connection with your Lord. Do not let your own notion of what should be and shouldn't be, whether it relates to greatness and success or the assessment of how your own life is unfolding, don't let that cause you to miss out on the wonders that God is doing. And why can we live without fear? Because of the second great phrase, I am with you. No matter who we are, where we are in life's journey, the God of unconditional, eternal love walks with us, providing purpose and hope. So today, go. Go in boldness. Your Lord and your community of faith, why they walk with you, engaging questions, seeking God, and finding greatness through being a servant of the risen Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.